Welcome to Applied Mathematical Finance. So we are still in our section on the discrete term structure model. So we have derived a model that simulates the full interest rate curve with ETO stochastic processes. So limitation is that we discretize the interest rate curve into forward rates. Yeah, but yeah, as I mentioned sometime, that's maybe not such a big uh, limitation because we do not observe so much uh, instruments yeah, that we have maybe much more data to to calibrate uh, a continuum. And yeah, we could, could also make the discretization uh, finer. So this is here um, our model yeah, in this version with the uh, factor loadings here, okay? Uh, so our model parameters, again, are the uh, initial value for the forward rate curve, the factor loadings. The factor loadings then can be decomposed into volatility and correlation. And of course, also the, the time discretization that is behind this. So our tenor discretization, so we consider here n forward rates li. What I'd like to do today is to do some numerical experiments. So we will build now using our implementation a simple model for numerical tests. So um, I have some, some kind of a model factory that creates a Monte Carlo simulation of an Euler scheme discretization of such a model where we could specify some of the parameters. As I mentioned earlier, our model is a model framework. Yeah, So it, it has so many parameters, for example, the factor loadings uh, that we can mimic also other models by specific parameterizations of these factor loadings. For example, the Hull White model is just a special version where we have to have a special choice for these factor loadings apart from the uh, fact that the interest rate curve here is discretized. So some of the parameters I will allow to specify to change uh, and the simple model that we will set up here will also be useful later when we try to investigate a little bit the behavior of correlation and volatility. So there are already some parts parameterized that we do not need today. Okay, a simple model for our numerical tests. So using our building blocks of our implementation, we create a simple model for our numerical tests. And what we consider as parameters are the tenor time discretization. So there is here the parameter, the period length, so our delta capital T. So you see it's an evenly spaced interest rate curve discretization, for example, period length is 0.5, one half, yeah, half a year. So we have a semi-annual forward rate. Uh, we also specify some time horizon. I will choose it to be 20 years. And we have a single initial value, the forward rate yeah, as our starting point. Maybe we can immediately look into the implementation where we built this. So this will be in our repository experiments. There is this model factory. So I will use here this code, create term structure model. And the simple parameters we specify here will be part of the constructor of our building blocks, and then finally enter into our model specification. So maybe I also show you the model specification in, again. So I will use here this library market model from covariance model. So 
it is a forward rate model, yeah, LIBOR market model, just the name for historic reason, where you can a little bit flexible specify the covariance model. The covariance model is the model for the factor loadings. So you see that this guy allows us to specify the measure, the state space transform, uh, the time discretization for our interest rate curve, the forward curve, the initial value, also there will be a discount curve, which we will discuss later today, and the covariance model. So um, for these guys, I just specify a few parameters. And what we do here in, in the code is, the first thing is we build a time discretization for our forward rates. So these will be these two parameters. And if this here is the code, you see we specify here the period length and the time horizon. This will create here the time discretization for our forward rates. So this is building the TIs. Then we specify the initial value for the forward rate curve. So this parameter is passed in here and it's just used here to specify a flat forward rate curve so all fixings yeah have the same forward rate initially that's enough for our experiments you could also model here some very flexible forward rate curve as an initial value for our model so this is the specification of the initial value, the Li of zero of our model. So here in the code, it is the next block, the forward rate curve. I, um, I missed this here on this slide, but there is another parameter that is important. And you see there is a use discount curve and if this Boolean is true, we will create a corresponding discount curve from that forward curve, and we will pass this to the model. We will see the reason for this later today. So here in the code, there is another parameter, use discount curve. And if this parameter is set, Actually, we will build here the corresponding discount curve. So this is the curve that maps Ti to the zero copper bond that matures in Ti, observed in zero, so the initial one. And actually, this guy is also creating an interpolation of this zero copper bond curve. So actually, we have the curve T maps to the zero copper bond that matures in T. So this is for the time discretization and the initial value. Next step in my code is create the time discretization for our Euler scheme. So the other time discretization that is part of our model. And this is maybe also a nice parameter I would like to use to play with. So you see there is the simulation time step and also the time horizon that defines my simulation time discretization. So this is the little, the delta little t. This is a parameter we can pass here. So you can step in finer step, yeah? not 0.5, for example, 0.1. So 10 steps per year, and this will create the simulation time discretization. So this is our next building block, our time discretization. So these are the little tj's. So what's next in our factory? So the next step in our factory is that we build our lambda ik, so our factor loadings, and we will build them in three steps. Actually, four step. Yeah, there is a four step here below. We specify the volatility, the correlation, 
And then we combine these to the covariance, so the lambda i case, yeah? And then we have a, an a additional step here, yeah, which I explain uh, next. So you see there are just classes that prepare these coefficients. And there is here, for example, the volatility model for parameter exponential decay. Well, I set two parameters to zero here, so there are two remaining parameters. And my model is an A, that's the first parameter, times exponential minus C, and then it's Ti minus Tj. No? So that's an exponential decaying volatility function. If you set the C to zero, it's just a constant volatility. A. So I have a few parameters to play with, and actually the exponential decay will be an interesting property which we can study later. So the next set is my set of factor loadings, which we decompose into a model for the volatilities and a model for the correlation. So for the volatilities, we would like to have some function that has an exponential decay, well, an exponential decay in time to maturity, yeah? So this here is the time to maturity. So the i's forward rate fixes in capital Ti, and capital Ti minus little t is the time that I'm away from this fixing, yeah? So, so little t is the simulation time. So I'm approaching the fixing. And so this is the time uh, to maturity. And I have an exponential decay in time to maturity. So the further I'm away from this point, the lower is the volatility. And there's also a parameter that specifies the level. Yeah, so a constant. So I have two parameters here, the volatility and this exponential decay parameter. For the correlation, I choose a model that has an exponentially decaying correlation. So I have a high correlation when two rates are close together. Otherwise, I have maybe a lower correlation. Well, volatility correlation will not be important today. Uh, so we will use these parameters in a later session to study the behavior. Yeah, this will be quite interesting. Also linked to the correlation is the number of factors. So this is our parameter M. So M is the number of factors. So if you go back to our model specification, this is here, our M. So it's actually the number of independent Brownian motions that generate the movements yeah, of our interest rates. Then I mentioned that we have an additional step, and this is um, that we write an additional factor in front of our lambda ik. So the lambda ik is not just these models for volatility and correlation. So there is an additional factor. So in addition to this volatility part and this correlation part, so these guys somehow define the correlation. We have an additional factor in front, and this additional factor is our interpolation between the log normal model and the normal model. So either for alpha equals zero, I have this part here. So it's just an Li sigma fik dw no? or duk. So it's a log normal model. Or if alpha is equal to one, yeah, so then it's just a constant, yeah, and it's just a scaling constant to have the same level for the volatility. So it's just the Li of zero, yeah, but it's still a normal model, yeah, because this is just um, a constant. So we will place this guy um, in front, and this big parameter is our local wall normality plant. So what is the interpretation of this? So for alpha equal zero, we have a log normal model. For alpha equal one, we have the normal one. 
So we can later study the behavior, what happens if we change from log normal to normal. A small uh, remark, uh, I will not use the log Euler scheme, even if we have alpha equals zero, so the log normal model. So I will always use my state space transform to be the identity. So if you have uh, alpha equals zero yeah, or small alpha, there might be a slightly larger discretization error from our Euler scheme. Okay, so you see these are here the blocks that create this. And in the end, there's just this covariance model. So we have as parameters, the parameters that enter into the volatility specification, the parameters that enter into the correlation specification, yeah, the number of factors are also associated with this, and the parameter that creates this interpolation between log normal and normal, and they enter here in on the next page, creating volatility, oops, okay. creating volatility, creating correlation, creating this factor in front, yeah, this blending between normal and log normal. So now we are almost done. So what remains, I specify the number of sample paths for our Monte Carlo simulation. Also, there is a factory telling what kind of random variable implementation mm -hmm. we need. Okay, that's a detail. It's not uh, so important here. And we specify the measure, yeah? So do we simulate under spot or terminal measure? So here in our little program, there is the parameter that we specify the measure, which enters into this property. As I mentioned, we do not use the log Euler scheme. So state space transform is normal. There are some specifications of interpolations. And for the Brownian motion, which we create here, there is the number of sample paths, of course, also the Monte Carlo seed specified. So the number of sample paths and the Monte Carlo seed can be changed also. And then everything goes into our Euler scheme and we are done. So I like to use this guy now to create different Monte Carlo simulations of Euler scheme discretizations of different models and study the behavior. So we have a code session. I will do the experiments in this class. So this class is just next to this model factory. So here's the model factory. Here is our experiment. So I will conduct some of these experiments here. And today we step a little bit, bit through this and try to understand yeah, how this, this model behaves. So you find today's code here. And there are many more experiments in this class, which we will use later again. So, and you feel free to modify the code and play a little bit with this. First experiment I like to do is the shape of the forward rate curve rotates under the equivalent martingale measure if we have a one factor model. So I've mentioned this before. And the reason is the specific form of the drift. So recall that we derived multiple versions for the drift. So there was, for example, here the terminal measure drift. Okay, looks like that. And we had also the spot measure drift, which looks like that. Actually, both look very similar. Yeah? So I have in all these guys, 
this term here. So there is a delta L, the period length, divided by one plus delta L, L. If this here is considered to be very close to one, then this is a little bit like an integral. Yeah. So there is a sum over the time step size, but now it's the time step size on your interest rate curve. So you are a little bit integrating over the whole interest rate curve. And you are looking here at the covariance. And this integral over the covariance over certain rates, we also had that in the terminal measure, yeah, so it was exactly the same. The difference is that in terminal measure, there's a minus, and in spot measure, there was a plus, but then the sum ran over different indices. So if you look, for example, to the terminal measure guy, so this here is the index J, for the forward rate for which we calculate the drift, and this drift is negative, and this sum is running over fewer such terms if this rate is further to the terminal point to the end. So there is the TN here. So this means that I have a larger negative drift here compared maybe to here. Uh, so larger negative if you assume that here our covariance term is positive. For example, assume that like in my model, all sigmas are the same. So the exponential decay does not exist. All sigmas are the same. And I have a one factor model, so correlation is one. So this means that the forward rates on the short end, they go down and they go faster down than the one and the other on the long end, under spot measure, you have exactly the same. You have now a plus, but the sum runs now from the forward rates that are before Tj to Tj. So you get um, um, a larger term if your forward rate is further to the end. So it's also rotating here. And first experiment is to we observe this rotation. So I simulate the forward rates curve and I simulate this for different observation times. So let's take a look at t equals zero, the initial curve, and then after one year and after five years. And we consider a one factor model so we choose our parameter m to be equal to one and our lambda parameter is just a constant. Yeah, So all guys get the same sigma. Yeah? So this means that all guys get the same sigma. So let's have a look. So I prepared this here so we can save a little bit time. And there is a function here, plot forward curves at time, and we can specify the observation time and the number of factors. So maybe let's study this function. What is this function doing? So you see, I specify a few parameters, initial interest rate curve, 5%, semi-annual time discretization, time horizon, 20 years. We do not use this discount curve parameter. Uh, the volatility is 20%. We use a log normal model. Uh, so correlation parameter, there is a here decay. There is a decay uh, described here. But if this is um, a one factor model, then actually this, this parameter does not matter. Yeah. So maybe I should update this here. Only matters if number of factors is not uh, equal to one. Yeah. So if it's larger than one. Uh, we can specify here the terminal measure and the spot measure. I use 50,000 passes. I just pass this here to our model factory. And what I get back is this term structure, Monte Carlo simulation model. So this was our very yeah, parsimonious interface. So if you take a look at this interface here, so what can you do? You can get some 
um, information, yeah, like the stochastic process, yeah, or the time discretization. But actually, the important part is that we get the forward rate observed at a certain time for a certain starting time of period and time. So note the parameters are not in the order like I use it in the lecture. Yeah, so this is little t, ti, ti plus one. So we can get this as a random variable. And I can also get the numeraire at a specific time. So these are the two nice important things. So here in our interface, I get the forward rate and the numeraire. So I just know that in the background, there is a model that creates this. So this is all I know. Um, and now let's plot uh, this curve. So I just define here um, a double two random variable function. So if you look, this is just a function that takes a floating point argument and returns a random variable. Okay, and what I map is from the period start, given the period start, I ask my model, give me the forward rate with this period start. Period end is just period start plus period length. So it's just the T for the period start and the T plus delta T for the period end. Observed at this time, yeah, and this time was an argument here to my, my little routine. Then I have a nice little helper that allows me just to plot this function here. So you can specify here the number of sample paths that you would like to see. So if you look here, this takes a time discretization, which is just our simulation time discretization. And then it takes um, a, a process in this sense that it takes this function. And you can specify the number of sample paths that you would like to see. Now let's... Uh, create this plot and we create this plot for time zero, time one, and time five. Okay, so I run this little program, initial curve. Time zero, time one, and time five, one factor model. Okay, and we see that we have indeed this kind of rotation. Yeah? So this is our initial curve. Time is equal to zero. If you move to time one, you see that you get a log normal distribution. Yeah, so we have a kind of sigma du driving the curves, sigma delta w driving the curve. It is a one factor model. So it means there is just one dw, one du in our formulation with the lambda i one du one. So there's just a single crown in motion driving all forward rates simultaneously. So here are our forward rates. Okay, they are all driven simultaneously up and down. My initial curve was at 5%. So some move up, some move down. This is maybe a log normal distribution. Yeah, so you see there is some kind of distribution that maybe looks like that. Yeah, so maybe it's log normal. Okay, and then you already see here that there is some kind of slope. Yeah, so this guy is here rotating a little bit, yeah, so this is moved up, this is moved down. As time moves on, we accumulate more and more drift, and this effect becomes larger, yeah, so you see, you have a much steeper curve, steeper curve here, yeah, so it has more rotated, and you also see that this rotation depends on the sigma so here, sigma is large. Here, so if I'm still around my initial value, yeah, so then sigma was maybe small. If you go back to the drift, 
you see that this effect of the rotation is larger if the sigma parameter uh, is large. Uh, wait, my sigma is a constant. So that does not make sense. Well, I have a log normal model. So in my log normal model, sigma i of t is my sigma i superscript l times l. Yeah. So it is that if the interest rate go up, then this coefficient becomes large. That makes now sense, yeah, because you see that the rotation does not depend yet now on the sigma parameter in my, my model specification, because that is a constant. It depends on this factor loading, which is in a log normal model, a sigma times L. So maybe I should write here, sigma i of t and L was large. Yeah, sigma i of t and L is sigma L times Li. And also here below, yeah, so the local volatility was was small, yeah, so the smaller the interest rates. So interest rate curve that have high interest rate become, get, get a stronger, stronger rotation. Yeah, okay, so now we understand uh, this, this uh, rotational effect a bit. So this is, by the way, here, spot measure. So for terminal measure, we get also this rotational effect. But between spot measure and terminal measure, we see another difference. Well, the difference is here in the range that our distribution covers. So here it goes from maybe 2% to 14%. And here it goes from, okay, I don't know where that, that is. Yeah, maybe also 2%, but here it goes to 20%. Yeah, so the graph goes to 25. Here it goes to, to, to 80. Yeah, so actually the curves do not move so high in the terminal measure. So why is that? Yeah, that is also understandable because our drift under spot measure is positive. So it will push the curve further up. Our drift under terminal measure is negative. So it will push the curve further down. Okay, so we have the same um, diffusion part for the curves. Yeah, but the drift shifts the distribution a little bit to the higher values or to the lower values. So why does this not change our result if we value a financial derivative? Because here uh, I get more samples on the high values and here I get more samples on the low values. Yeah, the reason is that the numerator is also different. Under spot measure, our numerator is starting in one and accumulating the interest rates. So the numerator is growing under terminal measure, our numerator is the zero copper bond that matures at the end. Yeah? So now we divide by this numerator and if the interest rate become larger, then the spot measure numerator will also become larger and compensate for this effect. Okay, so that was the first um, experiment. I already mentioned that uh, before. So we now understand that drift leads to this rotation of the curve. And if you have a one factor model, it's dangerous yeah, maybe to uh, value a financial derivative that has some dependency on the slope of the curve because under that model, there is a specific correlation between the level of the interest rate curve and the slope. So let's have a next, yeah, also a very nice um, experiment. The impact of the equivalent martingale measure on the approximation error. Yeah, so I'm talking about models, modeling, understanding the model, but I also 
talk often about numerical methods. And that's here um, a nice aspect. Choosing the equivalent martingale measure may have a strong impact on the approximation error you see in your financial products from our time discretization or from the Monte Carlo sampling the Monte Carlo error. So why do we have this problem that the equivalent martingale measure has an impact on our approximation error? So the first step is that the equivalent martingale measure determines the drift. Yeah, so we saw already an effect of the drift. Yeah, terminal measure is pushing curves more down. Spot measure is pushing curves up. So we saw that the two drifts, they look similar, but they have different terms inside. Then the drift of our forward rate is a nonlinear function of our forward rate. Yeah, first it is a nonlinear function because we have this factor one divided by one plus L, delta L in front. Yeah, but also if we have in our lambda a dependency on L, so for example, for a log normal model, then there is um, the lambda inside the drift. So this uh, drift then also depends uh, on the L because we have a dependency of the volatility on this, this L. So now we have two approximations here. First, there is our Euler scheme. This will create an approximation error on our forward rate because we freeze the drift at a certain point and then perform a time step. So it's the time discretization error. So hence we get an error in L from that. And because the drift depends on L, we get an error in the drift. The second error is that of the Monte Carlo approximation. We do a Monte Carlo simulation. So the forward rate, which we calculate is just um, a Monte Carlo approximation of the true forward rate. So we see a Monte Carlo error in L. Hence, we see another Monte Carlo error in the drift. And then since the next forward rate at the next time step, so now we do the time stepping, is creating by the previous forward rate plus the drift plus the diffusion, we see that the drift error is passing to the next forward rate. So the drift error will then again lead to an error in the next forward rate. And since the equivalent martingale measure changes the drift, we change by that the way the error is propagated to the forward rate curve at the next time step. So it's uh, reasonable to um, uh, expect that the choice of the equivalent martingale measure changes somehow the error in the forward rates. Yeah, it changes the composition of the drift and also the error propagation. To analyze this, I will look at uh, zero copper bonds. So we will look at zero copper bonds. So I will value a zero copper bond. I know the value of the zero copper bond analytically. I can calculate it analytically. Once I have the forward rates, I can calculate it just as the product, okay, from the time where I am now to here, this is now I minus one. 1 plus Lj observed in T, delta J, well, inverse, yeah, and we assume that we observe it in the initial time, yeah, so the M of T is just uh, zero, yeah, so I can calculate this guy analytically, so I can compare now the numerical valuation of my zero copper bond with the analytic value which I would um expect. 
Yeah, the zero copper bond is a very good um, object to test the drift because the value of the zero copper bond does not depend on the choice of the sigma, yeah, of the other parameters, yeah, of the correlation of so of our factor loadings of our lambdas. Yeah? So it just depends on our initial value. So it just depends on our Lj of zeros, our initial values. And the drift was the guy that ensured that the model is consistent with the observed uh, initial value. Recall also, we derived the drift by looking at zero copper bond divided by the numeraire should be a martingale. So that's a good object to investigate if the drift is implemented correctly and what is the numerical error of the drift. I will look at terminal measure, spot measure. So here on one slide, recall our numeraire. So we have terminal measure and spot measure. So for terminal measure, I have the negative drift running from the rate that I observe to the final time horizon. For the spot measure, I have a positive drift for the rate I'm looking at yeah, and going backward to the time where I'm observing the, the rate. Okay, so I comment this out yeah, because I do not want to see the other plots here again. And I have another experiment, test bond under measure. So you can pass here a few parameters. I can pass the simulation time step, the number of sample paths, and I can pass this use discount curve parameter. I will explain this later. So why we pass these parameters. So maybe just use this here now for 50,000 path simulation pass. And let's have a look how this experiment looks like. So I define again my parameters. Interest rate curve is flat at 5%. It's semi-annual. Yeah? Every half year, we have a forward rate. For 20 years, volatility is 30%. I use a log normal model. Um, it's a one-factor model, yeah? so I do not care about this. And I would like to investigate the measure, and the measure should be either terminal or spot. So here I'm just doing both combinations, and I'm creating my little model. So what I do now is I go through all maturities. So you see there's a loop here that goes through all maturities because I would like to value all zero copper bonds for all those maturities. So from the first one, yeah, I mean, maturity zero yeah, is, is, uh, is, is known. Yeah, the zero copper bond is one, uh, but for maturity one half, up to maturity, the last one in my model is the guy with the time horizon. So actually I could use here the time horizon parameter. And then I step in my period discretization. Yeah. So I, I step in 0.5. So that's actually here my, my period length. So I would like to value a financial product. And I have a financial product that is called bond. So that's a zero copper bond. From that, I can calculate here the value of this financial product. And then I can compare it with the analytic value. So maybe we should have a short look here into this code. So what is this get value method on this bond doing? Okay, so you see this bond is just a very tiny class that has this maturity. And when I call this get value, well, what I'm doing is I take the numeraire at maturity. So I ask my model, give me the numeraire. There is this time offset here, but this is actually zero. So I ask for the numeraire. So this is the N of capital T. Then I ask for the numeraire at evaluation time. So this is the N of zero. And then I calculate the 
difference. So this is n of zero, sorry, n. So this is n of zero divided by n of capital G. And then I return this random variable and on the outside take the expectation. Yeah. So this method here is returning the floating point double. So if you look into this, uh, So here, yeah, you see, it will just take the expectation of this, this random variable. Yeah, okay, so this is a bit hidden here in this utility product implementation that we calculate the value of the zero Cooper bond. What is the analytic value? Yeah, the analytic value is the product over one plus L delta uh, T to the power of minus one. So it's this guy here. But since all my forward rates are identical, it's just one plus this forward rate times the period length to the power of minus the number of periods. So you see it is one plus forward rate times period length to the power of, okay, you could write here minus, and then you could remove this one divided by, or to the power of maturity divided by period length. This is the number of period lengths we have, one divided by that, because it's one divided by one plus L times period length. Yeah, that's the analytic value. Okay, and then I can calculate the error. So maybe I have the error here as the analytic value, uh, the numerical value minus the analytic value. I also calculate here instead of the value, the yield. So that's just the logarithm divided by the maturity. So it's log P divided by the maturity multiplied with minus one. So if you interpret the zero Cooper bond as some e to the minus r t, this is calculate the rate r. This is sometimes a bit nicer thing to compare this error. So I can calculate this for the numerical value and for the analytic value. Sometimes a bit nicer because this object does not depend so much on the maturity. But you can do either way yeah, you can just compare the value or the um, yield, the rate. Yeah, so maybe let's run this guy for a set of 50,000 paths, sample paths. And we, he will automatically generate two plots. He will also print the result here below. Two plots, one for spot measure and one for terminal measure. Yeah? So here you see results, terminal measure, spot measure. So I'm adding all maturities and all errors to vectors and then I just plot a scatter. X is the maturity, Y is the error. So here is the um, result. So left-hand side is a spot measure. Right-hand side is terminal measure. Okay, that's an interesting picture. First observation, this guy is accumulating the error in somehow a smoother way. Uh, this guy is maybe also accumulating error. Yeah, it goes down here, but it is somehow noisy. Okay, why is that? Second observation, the error under terminal measure is much larger. This here is, yeah, say some factor five larger. So what happens if I change here to the other representation of the error using the yield? Okay, it's maybe a similar picture because my Yield is a minus logarithm, okay? It changes a little bit the direction. 
So now the error is accumulating, but it's going up. So my interest rate in the numerical seen in the bond is becoming too large. Also, here we have a similar picture. It's noisy. Yeah. Uh, here it is. It is smooth. Same observation. But now if we look in the metric of this yield, the difference is even more impressive. Yeah. So here I have a range from minus 2 times 10 to the minus 3 to 1. Here it is up to 2 times 10 to the minus 4. So in this metric, in this norm, in this measurement, it's a factor of 10 difference in the errors. So maybe let's study this picture because that's the guy that I have in the script. So this here is our experiment. This is now under terminal measure. And we observe first observation, this is a bit noisy. While the error under spot measure is accumulating more smoothly. So our first observation, why is this the case? Let's go back. <coughs> the reason for this is that we have an error in the forward rate. So these are the objects that carry the error. And in the spot measure numeraire, we fix the new forward rate. So the product, if the product increases by one index, it's the old numeraire multiplied with a new forward rate, but there's just a single new forward rate adding error to this quantity. So all the others are fixed. While for the terminal measure, we take always the whole set of forward rates L fixed at time ti. So all the guys will carry the new error they have accumulated from the drift. So they are all fixed in TI. So this is our observation number one. Yeah. So this is the reason why under terminal measure, it's much more noisy because all the guys get new errors and I have all the L's in the numeraire updated to the value that has accumulated another error. So let's maybe collect these observations here. Yeah. So the error under spot measure accumulates more smooth, smoothly. The error under terminal measure appears more random. And this is clear from the change of the fixing in this numeraire. Yeah. So Maybe this is one one point for the spot measure. The spot measure is a bit nicer because it has already the other rate fixed and there's only a, a, a one additional contribution in, in each time step. So next observation we have in our experiment, the error under the spot measure is small for t small, and it, it accumulates, it's large for t large. Huh? So maybe this is my observation zero now, because in terminal measure, it appears to be a bit different. Huh? So how is it in terminal measure? Well, it starts immediately very noisy. It's also becoming maybe higher over time. But then it goes to zero, okay? So here it is small for larger maturities. So the errors yeah, accumulate in spot measure and become larger and larger in terminal measure. Yeah, They are noisy, become large, but then they somehow become small again. Yeah, why is that? Okay, this is just because 
this product is becoming smaller, STI approaches the final time horizon. And here we have more factors as TI approaches the final time horizon. So clearly below, it's clear we accumulate more and more guys which have errors. Maybe sometimes we go back and it can compensate again, but we accumulate more. Here we have fewer terms, but the terms have more and more error. So actually here, it is not so clear if this is good that we have fewer terms because the terms have more and more error. And you see that if you look at the picture, the overall range is really significantly smaller for spot measure than for terminal measure. You see, for example, here you have a very large initial error, yeah, because you have a very large product and all the guys initially start with an error. So let's go back to our little collection. We observed that spot measure has a smaller error for smaller maturities. Terminal measure has a larger error for large maturities. Yeah, this is clear from the definition of the numerea. Yeah, the product becomes smaller for terminal measure. It becomes larger, more terms for spot measure. So that was our little observation zero. And we have also observed the overall error under spot measure is smaller than that under terminal measure. Okay. And this is not so clear immediately, but it comes from the effect that Terminal measure has actually more terms uh, accumulating the error. Yeah, so both guys are like um, are like a triangle. Yeah, so they have maybe the same number of terms. Yeah? So one is increasing in the number of terms, the other one is decreasing in the number of terms. However, in spot measure, it is just that one additional term is carrying a new error, while in terminal measure, it's that all the guys are carrying the additional error. So this is a little bit related here to this fact with the, with the fixing. So that was our observation number three. Okay, so we have maybe a nice um, intuition now why this picture looks like that. So where does the error now uh, come from? Yeah, Is it a Monte Carlo sample error? Or is it an Euler scheme time discretization error? So to, to analyze this, uh, change the simulation time step, making simulation time step finer would uh, reduce the Euler scheme discretization error. You know, you have weak convergence, one divided by delta T in Euler scheme, or increase the number of sample paths to investigate the Monte Carlo error, you know, you have uh, one divided by square root of number of sample paths uh, convergence order for the pseudo-random number generators. Let's try this. We vary the number of sample paths. So, you know, I pre uh, you see, I already prepared two other cases. Let's use 10,000 and let's use 250,000 sample paths with the same setup. Yeah. So this is um, a factor of five difference. If it would be a factor of four, square root of four is two. In each step, we would expect an improvement of a factor of two. Yeah. The error should be half in each step. Let's have a look. So I need to check a little bit my space. Yeah. So this here is terminal measure. This here is spot measure on top. Okay, and you see from 50,000 to 250,000, yeah, indeed, the error is approximately half. You're also here, hmm, 
it's not so visible, but a little bit the range is going here from minus 2, 10 to the minus 3 to minus 1.5. Okay, it's also a little bit like it is halving. Let's move these to the side and let's look at 10,000. So for 10,000, I also have something, okay, this is like from 0 to 3.5. Two. Well, but you see also the shape is here maybe a little bit different. Let's look what we have at, say, 8. Yeah. So at 8, I have here a 3 times 10 to the minus 4. And here at 8, I have a 1.5, a 10 to the minus 4. Yeah? So if you do not have this different in the shape, the accumulation of the error looks like we have half the error accumulated up to time 8. It really looks like it is a Monte Carlo sample error that we are accumulating here. So it is a Monte Carlo sample error, at least in these pictures. Uh, maybe here similar, it goes from minus 2.5 to 1.5. So it is a range of 4 times 10 to the minus 3. Here it is a range of 3. Yeah, so okay, if you remove this guy, the amplitude here is a little bit like a one or a two, yeah. So it's also halved here. That looks like a Monte Carlo sample error. Well, what happens if we vary the time discretization step? That would be my next experiment. So you see what I do here is I vary now the time discretization step from 0.5 to 0.1. So we go every five uh, so we are five times finer since we have reconversions of all of the time step size. Actually, the error should improve by a factor of five. So at what do we get there? So this is my previous picture. The 0.5 on the right-hand side and the new one, the 0.1, the finer time stepping on the left hand side. Yeah, and now there comes maybe a surprise. Okay, the shape of the curve changes. Okay, so here it goes like that. Also, here, yeah, the noise has changed, but actually the finer time stepping is worse. Okay, so here it goes from 0 to 2.2, here it goes from minus five times 10 to the minus five. So let's say zero to 2.5. So I see no effect and it's even getting worse. And also here, it looks as if it is, is getting way worse. Okay, what is, the, what is the explanation? Is my implementation wrong? There is a very subtle effect that makes life sometimes really hard. And the thing is that what we have here is a very large Monte Carlo error. I mean, it's not so large that our simulation is not usable, but it is quite large. Yeah, um, And the Monte Carlo error is dominating. And when you change the number of time steps, maybe those guys who followed numerical methods know this effect. Actually, now if I change the number of time steps, I'm using more random numbers for the same time span which means that at a later time step in, I use actually different random numbers than I have used in the simulation that uses fewer random numbers. So it's very hard to make actually now the random number sequence in our model such that we take the previous samples plus additional ones. So what should actually happen is happening here is that we, by changing the number of time steps, we have simultaneously changed the random number seed, the seed of the Monte Carlo random number generator. So I could also try this here. So maybe let's have some other seed. Okay, so now you will generate the same picture with another Monte Carlo random number seed. Maybe I throw away the guys for the 
determinant measure and just keep this. And you see that changing the random number seed changes the result. Sometimes you get larger ranges here. Sometimes you get smaller ranges. You get different, different picture. So actually the Monte Carlo error is the Monte Carlo error is dominating here so much, the problem, that we cannot see the effect of changing the time step. So time step stepping is maybe already fine. Okay, so going to the picture, varying the sample path, you have this here in the script. For terminal measure, yeah, we have 10,000 sample paths a larger range than if we go to 50,000, it's getting already a bit smaller, but 250,000, yeah, we see some, some good improvement, okay? So much more visible in spot measure, okay? Here we go almost up to a four or 10,000 sample pass. 50,000, we go only up to a two. 250,000, we go up to a one. It really steps like we would expect for Monte Carlo conversions. Yeah, varying the time step size, we get these pictures where actually we do not even see an improvement Yeah, because we have changed the random numbers and just get a different sample error. So collecting here, our error appears to be a Monte Carlo error. We see this order of one divided by square root of sample path um, improvements. We could, however, not analyze the dependency on the time discretization step. Uh, it appears as if the Monte Carlo error dominates the problem. So now comes a funny thing. We had this little Boolean use discount curve. And what I can do is I can correct, I can completely remove the error. So maybe I first show you the experiment. So let's comment that guy here uh, out. Take the next one, and I have the same parameters here. Time step, half, year, half a year, 50,000 passes, but now I use here true on the use discount curve. Okay, and let's run the two experiments, one with a false, the other one with a true. Ah, I was confused because I have the seed here changed. So maybe I set the seed back to my original one so the pictures look like uh, in my script. And now let's run the experiment again. Yeah, so one with a false, one with a true. So these are the two pictures here on top we've seen before. Left spot measure, right terminal measure. And now if you set this use discount curve to true, actually the error is gone. Yeah? I'm accurate up to, if you look here below, up to machine precision. So I can remove very easily this error. And there is also a nice link to um, a methodology. So correcting the zero point error, assume that um, we have here our numerator n star, and this numerator is our numerical approximation of the numerator. So it includes all our errors from the Euler scheme and from the Monte Carlo approximation. Then I can calculate the zero Cooper bond as if, uh, so, so then I can calculate the zero Cooper bond from my numerical implementation. So this is the guy that has the numerical error. So this is inclusive with the numerical error. So for the expectation operator, I use here an E hat to indicate this is my numerical calculation approximation of the expectation. Well, assume that I know 
that this here is the true value, I can calculate the zero covariant analytically, then I can define an adjusted numeria, and this adjusted numeria is now just defined by multiply with the zero coupon bond you calculate numerically, divide by the zero coupon bond that you know that should be the value that the guy that you calculate analytically. If you now value a zero coupon bond using the numerical implementation, yeah. so here I use the numerical implementation, using this adjusted numeria, okay, just plug in the definition of your adjusted numeria. So I just plug this in. So we get our N star, our numeria that has this numerical error, but then it's multiplied. And since this factor here is deterministic, yeah, we can move it outside of the expectation. So I just multiply with P star, divide by the analytic value. Okay, since I divide by the numeria, it is actually multiply with the analytic value, divide by the numerical value, which means that my numerical value is canceling so that I just get as a result the analytically corrected value. Okay, you have a multiplicative adjustment, a deterministic multiplicative adjustment for the numeria. If you take the logarithm on this equation, yeah, if you take the logarithm here on this guy, this means the logarithm of the adjusted numeria is the logarithm of the unadjusted numeria minus the log of one divided by the numerically calculated numeria plus the, the logarithm of one divided by the analytically calculated numeria. So you see, this is like a control variate on the numeria. Even better, you could say if your numeria is just an DN, R, N, D, T, it is like a deterministic control variate on the drift of the numeria. So this is like a control variate on the drift of the numeria. So maybe you remember from numerical methods, control variate is that you replace a random variable X for which you like to calculate an expectation by some other random variable Z, where Z is the original random variable minus a control, and the control is the random variable of your control minus the analytic value. Actually, you do not need this here. Just a small reminder. This is what we are doing here. We are analytically correcting the drift of the numeria. So this method can be used also in other applications, but here it is the implementation in our library, so in our model. So going back to our model here, there is the method get numerea. And you see this method get numerea has indeed here a question if there is a discount curve, then use this discount curve and adjust the numeria. So what we do here is exactly what we have on the slide. So what we do is here, we calculate the numeria numerically. So this here is our N star. From that, we calculate our bond. So our bond is just the expectation of one divided by the numeria. So this gives us our P star. Okay, there is the expectation here in the end. Okay, but I can move it inside the expectation. And here we multiply and divide yeah, with this ratio. Yeah, so this is our P zero divided by star. So we, we just do this adjustment and this adjustment will remove our error in our numeria.
Okay, so we get these nice uh, results. Let me conclude with a small check. We corrected now the drift of the numerea, but this is potentially dangerous because we argued that the numerical error is in our Monte Carlo simulation Euler scheme of the forward rates. So the forward rates still have the Monte Carlo error. So it is dangerous to just correct the error in one place and then use this model because now the corrected numerea is maybe inconsistent with the uncorrected forward rates. So we have to check what is happening to our forward rates that still carry the numerical error. So the approximation error of the forward rates, we just value now a forward rate. So last experiment for today is that I would like to have a look at the numerical error of the forward rates. So how does this look? So I go through all measures use this concurve, yes, no. And what I value here is a financial product that just pays a forward rate fixed at the fixing time for different fixings paid at the end of the period. So let's open this product. So you see what I do is I just ask the model, give me the forward rate give me the numerair, I divide the forward rate by the numerair, multiply with the numerair at evaluation time, and take the expectation. So it's just this guy here um, on the slide. I can ask for the value of the bond. So I have the value of the forward rate. Well, our forward rate, valuing this product here gives me the forward rate multiplied with the bond. So to obtain the forward rate, I need to divide by the zero copper bond price. So let's calculate the zero copper bond price. I define again the bond and the forward rate is the value of paying the forward rate at a certain time divided by the zero copper bond. And then I compare this to the analytic value. Well, here on the slide, I have also the period lengths here. So my analytic value is forward rate multiplied with period lengths, forward rate multiplied with period lengths. And then I compare the error. And plot this again. So I will now immediately get um, four pictures for the two different measures, the spot measure and the terminal measure. And maybe I move this on the top with control variate and without control variant. Okay, and you see, there is no difference, at least not from the eye. Also, if you move this here on top, yeah, and you switch now through the windows, you see there's, oops, there's still the sky. Ah, it's, uh, I should have commented the other experiment out. Hmm. Sorry. So if you now jump through the windows, you see there is no difference between using the control variant or not using the control variant. And also if this you checked here the numbers, yeah, so this here is with control two under spot measure, you can check here number 3.235. This is control uh, false. 
3.235. The numbers are exactly the same, maybe some machine precision rounding error. So it appears as if our correction has no influence on this error of the forward rate, which is a good news because we corrected just the numeraire, but we did not make something wrong to all our other quantities. And you can prove this mathematically. So we have here the nice uh, picture. So the reason is that we defined our forward rate in the way that, yeah, if you go back now to our section on curves, this was our definition of the forward rate. The forward rate is value paying this index divided by the value of the zero copper bond. So we later defined the forward rate in this way. So I value now my forward rate, paying this index, and I divide by the value of my zero copper bond. And the, the thing is that both these objects are now defined in terms of my numerical valuation. If you go back to the code, I'm valuing paying the forward rate and I'm valuing paying the zero cobalt bond both numerically. Yeah. So you see there is here the get value with the model and the get value with the model. Both are valued numerically. So if you now do our correction, yeah, I have to investigate what happens if we have here the corrected numeraire inside of both these parts. Well, the correction is just a correction factor that stands there, a deterministic correction factor, which will just cancel out. So this correction does not matter. So if we have our corrected numeraire with this adjustment factor, we just have our numerically numeraire with the numerical errors multiplied with our correction factor, I can move the correction factor out of the expectation. Then this here is just the numerically calculated forward rate. And then I just divide again with the correction factor, yeah? or you could say I have here the numerically calculated zero copper bond multiplied with the corrected zero copper bond divided by the numerically calculated zero copper bond. So the zero copper bonds cancel and I get for the valuation, the previous numerically calculated forward rate. So using here this adjusted numeraire to value our forward rate does not change the forward rate we observe, which is a good, good thing. So our correction is just a correction that X acts on the discounting but it does not act on the forward rate. Our forward rate simulation is still, still the same. So this observation is different if you look at the forward rate by dividing by the analytic zero copper bond. This is also here in the code. Yeah, It's actually not the right way, but here I'm calculating paying the forward, and then I divide by the analytic zero copper bond. So if you do that, you will get now two pictures. So one for using the control, one without, for say spot measure and terminal measure. And if you now go cycle through the pictures, you see that they are 
changes in the forward rates that we we observe. Yeah. The, the funny thing is actually the uncorrected value is now the one that is changed because uh, we observe that if we have the correction, um, um, then it cancels out. But now actually I use here the analytic serial copper bond. So this is already the guy that is corrected. But if this here is the uncorrected value, okay, then we see a mismatch. Okay, so maybe in the script, not so not so present, but you can experiment with this uh, in the code. This was the first part of my numerical experiments. You see that in my code, I have actually much more stuff coming up here. Yeah? Uh, more interesting stuff, which we will do later. The last remark is that what we have in our model implementation that we adjust for the Numerea curve, we can use it also uh, really as part of the model to model a separate forward curve and a separate discount curve. So we could use this trick to model a separate discount curve and separate forward curve. For example, to model our sit situation with the collateral curve. So our trick with the adjusted numerator could use, be used to, to model counterparty default risk or um, a collateral curve. Maybe we do that in the next session.